Today, I am excited to have an amazing marketer and an even better human on the show who is behind the digital push of the iconic American Girl brands, Alex Suazo. Thanks for coming on the show, Alex. Welcome to Marketing O'Clock. I love this, Greg. <laughs> Super right. excited to be here. <laughs> so before we get into your digital journey, yeah. I like starting off with one job or gig that you've had that people who even know you might not know that you've done. Oh my gosh. I feel like I've been so social my entire life that everyone knows every job I've had. Um, okay. And I can say this in high school, I worked three jobs Okay, <laughs> like the end of high school into college, um, which was lifeguarding, um, a sales associate at Bloomingdale's and, um, like cater waitering, which was like Friday, Saturday nights and Sundays, lots of good money in high school. That's awesome actually, <laughs> those are three really good life skills. Oh, yeah, Being able sure. to do sales, yeah. to deal with maybe irritable customers, mm -hmm. and then be able to save lives. That's exactly. amazing. <laughs> so well-rounded. <laughs> All right. So those are three jobs that weren't in the digital space. Yep. But what was the first job that you had that got your foot in the door with digital marketing? That's a good question. So it's funny. I've, I've been thinking about like my LinkedIn bio and, and how to edit that because, um, I've realized that I spent so much time on AOL in high school that I would argue that like that was my first story <laughs> into like the, the interwebs. Um, no, but my, my first job that really got my foot in the door was actually my second job. And it was an awesome opportunity, um, to work on Castro USA, which is the motor oil. Um, but they also had huge partnerships with uh, the NFL, Major League Soccer, and John Force Racing, which was really cool. So early on, it was like 2009, 2010, doing like content marketing and stuff on Buddy Media for anyone out there that remembers mm -hmm. Buddy Media. Um, so that was my first foray. And it was it was awesome. It was like, we need to be live tweeting organically. <laughs> and that was all the rage then. Um, but that really got me excited. Um, I was also like personally blogging and tweeting on the side. So it was kind of a dream come true, not doing like the traditional PR marketing that I did in undergrad. All right. And so you're basically an oil baron. Um, Is that <laughs> factual to say? <laughs> I'm a little bit, I've, I've definitely hopped around industries. I, if we get to talk about a lot of my different experiences, I've gone from like, you know, high end luxury, like fashion event production to motor oil to like grocery and now obviously toy and retail, which is pretty cool. Awesome. And was that the, your, so that was your first job for first foray into digital sure. marketing. Yep. What was your first full time? Was that, was that the position? No. So my first full time, actually, um, so my undergrad was kind of in a program that was very um, ad agency focused, which was interesting. So the program was essentially like three different um, paths you could take, which was like account management in the agency world, PR for anyone that didn't want to go like Madison Avenue agency um, and creative for the creatives. And so I did account management. And so fresh out of college, I said, I wanted to intern at an ad agency, did that, didn't love it. And then said, I wanted to try PR and marketing. So I did intern at this events company and they ended up bringing me on. So I was doing kind of traditional PR media pitching as well as marketing for this event company. And basically I was like, I don't care much that you're on the cover of Sunday styles. Like I want to be <laughs> tweeting and blogging cause that's what I'm doing in my personal life. And that's when I got that job at Castrol. Okay. And it yeah. sounds like the agency side might not be for you, but you did like the in-house working directly with a brand. Yep. What do you think, really draws you to working for a brand instead of being agency side specifically? Um, so it's interesting because I've been towing the line, you know, nine, 10 years later from where I started. But then it was definitely more about um, kind of breathing and knowing and being in the brand day to day and understanding the consumer. So what I think was super interesting about industry hopping as well was that, you know, again, I went from um, a very kind of high end premium event interested B2B audience in my first job 
to a consumer very much interested in motor oil and sports. Um, so that to me is just so interesting. You know, when you work on the agency side, you can also get that versatility, but working in house, you just, you know, the consumer so much better. Um, you know, what makes them tick and, and the testing that you can do in house with all the data, et cetera. Um, I just love that so much more, especially as we move into, you know, digitally transforming a lot of these, you know, more legacy brands and businesses. Fantastic. Yeah. So you've now worked with, you've gone from the agency side and you've now worked with many brands from the likes of Fairway Market, MWWPR, Castrol USA, New York Cruise Lines, to name a few. What is something that people should know when they are trying to become a successful digital marketer for the brand side of things? Ooh. <laughs> um, let's see. So I think, um, oh my gosh, my point of view has changed so much, I would say, in the past three years since coming to such a large organization like Mattel and working on such a global brand like American Girl. Um, I think the advice I would give is to definitely kind of try the different areas of digital marketing. So um, prior to American Girl, you know, I was overseeing every digital touch point for the consumer. So there was a lot of testing as it related to Google specifically and SEM and SEO with you guys um, to testing into Facebook and paid social. And I think all of those are really exciting touch points with the consumer, but mm -hmm. they both also play such different roles in the consumer journey. And so I think understanding where your interests lie as it relates to content marketing, um, kind of social content in general versus what can sometimes be more static, strategic, tactical, like paid search ads and display ads and things like that. So getting a taste for all of those things, I think is super important. Um, and, you know, at the root of understanding your brand, knowing how much of that is conversion driving versus higher funnel, getting people to move down the funnel and understanding like where your interests lie in that full funnel. Um, you know, in my previous role at New York Cruise Lines, I was also digital product. So I was really like full digital experience. Um, and it's interesting because I miss it a little bit. And I like the idea of like building digital experiences as well as driving the marketing um, to them. So I think it's a matter of dipping your toe in different things and following great podcasts about digital marketing, you know, and understanding what it is that makes you tick content, conversion, et cetera, and then taking it from there. <laughs> Oh, I know a good podcast about that. <laughs> I know. This too. one that you're on right now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, that, that's really interesting to say that you want to be able to, again, to, to your point, dip your toe in all these different, yeah. these different facets and then go towards what really moves you. Yeah. Um, so, so that's phenomenal. And I'd imagine that you probably haven't found, or and maybe you have, mm -hmm. uh, a position that allows you to to see everything, you know, I guess to that point, has yeah. it helped being in different positions in different companies as well to kind of find out what you, what really drives you? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. I think, um, at Amer American girl, like many other companies, I remember being at, um, I don't know if it was HubSpot or Adobe summit a few years ago and hearing Coca-Cola talk about how, you know, from their chief digital officer, how they were just starting digital transformation. I think for a lot of these legacy brands like American girl, um, we have to start digitally transforming. So I would say my role two years ago here felt a little more siloed and very much kind of only digital marketing. Um, and I think in just these uh, two years, as of a couple weeks ago, <laughs> um, it's already kind of become a little less siloed and more um, a little more of that 360 and kind of complete digital experience that I would that I would love to have. So it's baby steps, right? Every company is mm -hmm. kind of working in that direction, but really taking down. The silos, because at the end of the day, you know, I, I can't work in a silo over here on driving traffic to a website um, without being able to affect where that traffic is going and how to optimize that as efficiently as possible. So there's definitely a two-way street there um, that, you know, teams really need to be collaborating on in such large organizations like this. So definitely moving in the right direction. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So... One thing that, that at least in the, I guess, more paid and search side mm -hmm. of the industry can be a bit of a divisive topic is yeah. education. And, yeah. you know, I think <laughs> some good examples where, where you'd see somebody like a Disney World um, having, you know, requiring certain education levels to have somebody come on um, to, say, be a, a SEO specialist or something yeah. like that. I know that I read an article that you were featured in talking about how a 
masters had helped you, and I know that's something you had talked about. Can you run through your thought process and yeah. uh, the master's process in general, and if it's yeah. helped in general, and any <laughs> advice for all the people who are probably making that decision as well? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. Um, I actually had heard a lot of feedback about getting a master's or MBAs um, and never doing it at your same alma mater like from undergrad. Mm -hmm. And I didn't hear that until after I finished my master's. <laughs> okay. uh, but the program director of my undergrad actually created the the master's that I ended up participating in. So it was kind of, um, I had been thinking about a master's and I'll kind of explain a little bit why in a sec, but I'd been considering a master's, but like did not want to take the GMAT <laughs> um, or the LSATs for that, you know, like I didn't want to take another standardized test. And um, the opportunity kind of dropped in my lap to be a part of this first class of this master's program in branding and integrated communications. And it just felt like an awesome, you know, years later, kind of getting back into that very collaborative group environment um, of kind of creative and strategic um, problem solving for consumers and brands and things like that. Um, and having been in smaller organizations, I wasn't kind of getting that opportunity as much as I'd like. So, you know, the timing was perfect um, and I decided to pursue it. Um, I will say in general, I don't think I was necessarily pursuing it um, for I think a lot of the reasons people think about it, right? To kind of mm -hmm. make more money or get that other level. I was doing it more so because um, I wanted to be able to grow within an organization and a brand as more of a strategist. And so it just felt like if I wasn't getting that expertise at an agency, which is really where you get a lot of that varied strategic expertise in, in creative problem solving for consumer issues and, and, and brand health issues, um, I felt like maybe a master's in kind of a similar parallel um, topic would would be super helpful. So I, I ended up doing that. It was a kind of, I'm not going to call it easy. It was hard doing it full time. <laughs> um, but it was a really awesome program. Um, and it was done again by that director of the undergrad. So it was kind of structured in the same way. Um, but it was with people from all walks of life, um, from different countries, from different industries, um, some fresh out of undergrad, some with a lot more experience. And so I think if, it, if we're talking about the same article, a lot of what I took away from it and what I would share with people is that um, if you're working in smaller organizations where you don't have exposure to different types of people, work ethics, um, you know, work style, um, personality, you know, industry expertise, um, I think a master's is a great way of kind of getting your foot in the door to kind of learn how to work more collaboratively with different types of people. Um, so that was kind of my big takeaway that I outlined in that article, because to me, um, you know, and then coming to such a large organization like American Girl, a little bit of a culture shock with the Midwest from New York City, um, having that versatility and, and um, agility to uh, work cross-functionally, um, regardless of background, mm -hmm. experience, level, et cetera, um, I think that's what's paid off for me more so than anything else, um, which has been awesome. So I say do it, but if, you know, don't get in too much student debt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, to that point as well, yeah. in case you couldn't hear from the explanation, you, it wasn't like you just layered a master's on after your, your undergrad, right? No, you no, no. got some real life experience, mm -hmm. saw what was happening. Yep. Would you recommend that that's the case? Or would you say if you had to go back and do it again, would you just stack it all together and get it done as fast as you could? I am glad I took the break. So it was about five years in between. Um, going back to that idea of dipping your toe in different areas, I think that's what was super important to me. I think I learned in those five years that I want to be in digital. I want to continue being at the forefront, you know, and those, those roles and job descriptions like were ever changing for so many years. People like that job with Castrol, I was an interactive program manager. I'm like, <laughs> what does that even mean? Um, you know, and even now I was hired at American girl as kind of like a, a manager, senior manager of digital marketing. And that was, you know, again, specific to managing digital specialists in SEM, in email, in content. Um, but I think that having learned what I was interested in and, and kind of knowing that I wanted to be in management of digital and I wanted to be able to have a seat at the table in business strategy as it relates to digital experience, 
I learned that enough in those five years to know that mm-hmm. I needed more exposure to different types of people and kind of needed that next level of education to kind of tie that up in a nice little bow for, for me personally, I think to help pitch me as a little bit more of a business strategist than just kind of a, um, like a digital specialist in a lot of ways. Right. But, but if you start dipping your toe in things and realize like, I just want to do SEO all day. I do not mm-hmm. think a master's is necessary. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So absolutely, that's a fantastic answer. And yeah. I guess is, is it sounds like that's your advice almost that yeah. you know somebody that's on the fence right now that may have been in an introductory job that they might not be the happiest about. What that's what you tell them. Is that what you tell them? Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, I think, and it's hard. It's super hard in digital, and I think even still now, you know, as I look at job descriptions out there, you know, I'm trying to fill an email marketer role, if anyone's (laughs) looking, but it's like, as you, um, as you go out there and look at the types of roles, I do believe in a lot of places, things are still a little siloed. And so I just think that, um, getting a better understanding of at the highest level, what you think you're most interested in. Is it, you know, the strategy around content? Is it the conversion? Is it being tactical? Is it being a little higher? Um, I think is super important before pursuing more education. Um, because I think of places, I mean, general assembly is pricey. Um, but you know, maybe it's easier or, or more efficient, um, to get a certification in something that kind of carries just as much weight, especially in digital. Um, so yes, I think get an understanding of what you like and do a lot of it on your own outside of work, you know, really talk to people. I've, I swear I've been the biggest proponent of networking and LinkedIn, and I'm so proud that LinkedIn has like become what it is now because I'm just like, you got to get out. You got to meet people, never not take a call with someone, you know, talking through your experiences and what you like and what you don't like starts helping you really shape what it is that you want to do. Um, and I, I would recommend that before just jumping into a master's any day. Absolutely. And so you talked about general assembly there mm-hmm. and you also talked about the fact that you hire people. So <laughs> is, that, is that something that you look at that, that helps a resume stand out that people can add that might be a half measure, right? If, if a master's is a full measure, do you consider that? Do you look at those different certifications in the process of bringing them in for interviews? Yeah. So i um, literally looking for an email marketer right now. And in this case, just given... Um, given the fact that there's not a lot of consumer marketing in Madison, um, and given that, um, you know, Mattel American Girl just moved to a new marketing cloud of which the ESP is, is not one that many people like, um, I am looking for very specific expertise in email marketing. So to me, I, I'm not looking for a master's, um, you know, we're, we say kind of four years, you know, bachelor slash GRE. But to me, I'm looking for, you know, have you been in an ESP? Have you been close to CRM and understanding contact streams and, and managing dev vendors and, you know, QAing and all of that. And that's a lot more technical expertise, right? So that's not something you're going to learn in a master's that comes with time, you know, in in the job. Um, So it depends on the role. Um, And so the digital specialists under me, right now are all very much, um, you know, know what they're the tactical piece of what they're doing. Um, but I've been on panels interviewing others where, uh, you know, peers of mine, where it's a lot more important to have had some, some business expertise, um, that you could get in a master. So I think it depends on what the role is. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. So I'm going to do a little segment here where I read from oh. your LinkedIn. <laughs> Uh-oh. And here is from <laughs> your LinkedIn profile. Okay. Led social and content marketing strategy to leverage Super Awesome slash Mattel partnership to launch American Girls official Pop Jam channel. Pop and here's Jam. another one. Mm-hmm. Working in hand with product and digital dev team to explore voice capabilities to deliver character story worlds through new digital mediums. All the things. So it's safe to say that these things didn't exist three years ago. Nope. What is your strategy when you have to take something on for a major brand that just has never been done before? How do you go about doing that? Yeah. Um, so I have to say I feel very fortunate um, being at American Girl um, because it's so much more than just a toy company. And, you know, this isn't to sell AG in any way, but, you know, a lot of the women and kids that grew up with American Girl know that, you know, they came with so many robust characters and strong storylines and story worlds. Um, 
you know, a lot would argue you think of Pottermore, you think of the Marvel universe. I mean, we have these robust characters. So interestingly, a lot of the extensions into kind of IoT and, and different digital platforms for, for kids that are COPPA compliant um, fit really well into what we do day to day. So it's a little easier in that um, testing into new technologies and platforms is um, doesn't necessarily require like production of all brand new content and storylines and things like that. They kind of naturally fit into a lot of the new technology and experiences um, for both girls and moms. Um, so that's kind of one step that's a little easier because the, there's not as much buy-in around budget for creating or producing new content. Um, however, um, we do have the flexibility with um, having a lot of our creative done in-house. We do have an amazing creative studio in-house. We do Facebook Live productions. We do a lot of um, all of our kind of catalog lifestyle photography, et cetera, in-house. That enables us to be able to say or enables me to position it as more of an opportunity to say, A, here's another place that our content can live and another touch point for one of our consumers, whether it's the girl or the mom. Um, and secondarily, I can I can kind of position it as a, a test and learn. So for something like Pop Jam, um, it's essentially, for anyone that doesn't know, it's essentially an Instagram for kids. Um, lots of limitations in terms of, um, you know, how much they're able to comment. They have like human moderators 24-7 um, and the kids essentially re-jam content, um, which is really cool. And so to, for buy-in for that, because I didn't really need media dollars, I was able to kind of just say, you know, I have an analyst on my team. She's our community manager. Um, you know, she's got some bandwidth. Let's take the content we're already creating, ensure that it's COPPA compliant and start pumping it onto Pop Jam and see what our, um, what our engagement's like and start kind of benchmarking that against Instagram, which for us is also a very heavy kind of doll play community. So in that case, again, if it doesn't require dollars, it's kind of very easy to test them. Nice. It's really great. And you can kind of position it as more of a, an extension of the content in a new place. Um, something like voice capability is a little different. I think that one we still don't technically have buy-in and we haven't uh, officially created a skill that we've tested. Um, but there's essentially with every character launch that we have, which is more than one a year in most cases, um, we have robust storylines for them and we have VO for them. We have, you know, book um, storylines for them. And so for our 28 teen girl of the year, Luciana Vega, she was a big STEM girl. She's got like awesome NASA um, and Mars Habitat toy. Like it's, it's an amazing product line. <laughs> nice. um, we had a ton of VO for her. And so I, I was able to pitch a skill, um, an American girl skill that um, essentially you opened up and you could say like, you know, how can I play with Luciana today or read me a part of Luciana's story? Um, that is something where, you know, while I had to kind of say that there would be some dollars behind really developing the skill or getting a platform that could help develop the skill in house. Um, didn't kind of get it launched for us, but to me, it's all about how can you use what you have and not recreate the wheel to test into these technologies? Cause I think, I mean, maybe much easier in a startup, smaller organization, but in these larger organizations, it comes down to a lot about resourcing and budgeting. And so to be able to say, guys, we have this, and it's a perfect format for this other extension, that's like 50% of the battle. If it requires spend and we don't have it, <laughs> you might spend <laughs> But I keep pushing every year because I will get an AG skill. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So I mean, it really sounds like you just need to envision it, imagine it, yep. pitch it, and then kind of see oh, okay. if it gets picked up or, or not. But yeah. you know, I, I like that your approach is let's give it a go. Let's see. And again, as long as we've got these these benchmarks for engagement, yep. this and that, we'll know it's successful. Yeah, no, for sure. Pop Jam has been actually really great. So we, in a weird way, American Girl has incredible organic engagement on, <laughs> on Facebook and Instagram that a lot of brands cannot, you know, do not enjoy as much as we do. Um, and Pop Jam has very similar engagement, which is awesome. And like the demo on there is is spot on. So yeah, I think it's def it's definitely all about storytelling, right? And how you position it when you pitch it to the organization and and see how they take it from there. Great. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about some of the jobs that you've had yep. starting an agency, then moving in-house and you know, coming to where you are today. Mm -hmm. 
What is one of the traits that you have specifically that's led you to success in all these different positions? What should people emulate from <laughs> from your personality? <laughs> Smile and be friendly <laughs> and be super social. <laughs> um, no, I have to say um, it's actually really interesting. My the, so the director of that undergrad that did um, the master's program, um, we all had to have like a final kind of thesis portfolio at the end of that master's. And I said, you know, it's really hard to have a portfolio when you're more of a strategist because a you kind of led a lot of that strategy, but really helped facilitate getting it done. And so how do you present that in a portfolio? And so I was like, you know what, what I need to present is, is what I learned from the program, which was that I'm really great with people and that I can kind of help people stay together to get things done. So that was my whole angle. I even had a bottle of Elmer's glue um, and I had a, like a method or a model to kind of my style of leadership, which was glue. And it yep. was because we kind of said, you know, I'm like the glue that holds people together to get stuff done. And I think a lot of that comes from, you know, um, being open to a lot of diverse working with diverse different people of different ages. I joke around all the time when I worked at Fairway Market, I was actually in IT um, I was there for about two and a half, three years, and I worked with these two like old men, like Russian PhDs in like database management and applications. And I'm like, then I was like, what am I doing in here? And in hindsight, I'm like, those were like two to three years, like best experience of my career to date. Um, but it's for me, it's really about, you know, be open to conversation, grab, you know, I tell my team all the time, a lot of people are interested in what you do here. They love social and they want to know what's happening. Like go grab coffee with someone new every couple of weeks. Um, because I just think that communicating and, and learning how to bring people together in that way, um, is what's going to make the world go round, <laughs> not just at work. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, that will bring us to this week's lightning round uh -huh. where I've got four questions to wrap up here. Okay. And is there a book or a blog post or a website that's had the biggest impact on your career specifically? Wow. So marketing o'clock is new. <laughs> but I've been following you guys. There. Just one. Um, hmm. Okay, I'm I'm gonna forget the authors, um, but AKQA is um, a huge digital agency. I hope they're still around under the same name. But they wrote a book called Velocity um, that I read a few years ago, probably in 2012, because um, I remember ordering the book for like everyone in IT. But it was essentially um, co-written with a Nike executive, and okay. it was all about velocity and how quickly brand and digital transformation um, was happening even then and how that agency and Nike worked together to, to deliver and test into a lot of those uh, marketing technology and digital experience concepts. And I reread that every now and then because it's fascinating to me <laughs> how so many people still don't understand the velocity at which things are moving. Um, and so it's a good refresher that um, you have to keep the consumer at the center of everything you do and understand how their habits and the way they consume media and content is changing on a daily basis. Fantastic. That's, yeah. What was your biggest mistake throughout your digital marketing career? In retrospect, um, so the way I typically talk about my career is, is that every move was very strategic. I think I was always kind of craving, um, being the go-to person for a brand at a company for all things digital. Um, you know, when I, when I had the awesome opportunity to work with, with Cypress North at New York Cruise Lines, that was me. I got to work with the B2B team. Um, I got to work with IT, with all the business apps, et cetera, as well as all the digital marketing. Um, so when I was working at Castrol, I only had that social piece. And I, um, I don't think I jumped ship too soon, um, but my step after that was MWWPR. I wanted to try agency one more time, but in the in the new business development side of their um, of their firm. And so essentially, I was helping build up their digital practice. Um, and it was a little too early in the game for them to really be pitching mm -hmm. um, their consumer brands to run their digital when they really didn't have the expertise. So I was only there for about a year. And I wouldn't say it's, it was a mistake, but I think um, 
it probably would have made more sense to to move into a digital role working on a brand to just have that consistent um, brand digital strategy kind of expertise. Also, All right. No regrets, but <laughs> uh, you know, an off step at one point. Perfect. Okay. Another tough one here. I don't know why this is called the lightning round, to be honest with you. <laughs> I know. I think my answers are too long. It's not like <laughs> no, it's fine. All right. You have a time machine that oh. will go back 10 years. What career advice would you go back and give yourself? There's a very gray line. Um, but I, I'm going to just say, I'm going to say patience. <laughs> and I think it's hard. It's hard to have patience, but it's, it's a huge character, um, not flaw. What's the opposite of flaw? Like it's, it's something that I think as a business person and in your career, you know, if you don't have patience, you might find yourself moving around a lot in lieu of, you know, trying to get the next opportunity or work on the next brand, you know, be ahead in digital, et cetera. I don't regret any of it, but I think, um, I think having stayed a little longer in some places may, may have helped tell a better story or kind of work on another new thing or help move the business a little bit. I think mm -hmm. because digital and social were so, you know, new in, in 2009, 2010, et cetera, um, I kind of felt like, oh, I'm not learning enough. I'm not doing enough. You know, I, I want to move on to the next thing. Wherein the reality is that like the next job didn't really know what they needed out of the role either. Right. And so mm -hmm. there, I feel like had I had a little more patience, I might've been able to, um, have potentially more like substance, substantive, substantive, <laughs> substantial, substantial, <laughs> um, roles, you know, like the MWWPR thing felt like something where I could have waited a little longer working on Castro USA, um, then kind of doing that jump into PR, so patience, I think, is big, and I continue working on it. It's something I'm focusing on here at American Girl. <laughs> it's important, but it it, to me, it is the worst answer anybody could give to me. No when they're way. like, all you need is patience. <laughs> it's like, I don't have any of that right now. I like, know. That's, it's so that's why I'm asking hard. the question. I know. It's so <laughs> hard. I, I feel like, though, like... I, in retrospect, I'm like, it was like I was waiting for everyone to digitally transform ASAP, like move faster, move mm -hmm. faster. And the reality is like, unless you go start your own agency where you've, you've got a dev team and you're able to work on those newer things, it takes people, especially like cross-generationally at companies, like it takes people a while to understand velocity and that, you know, if we want to be relevant, count the years in advance next year, um, we've got to move faster. So I think it, it's more patience relevant, you know, as it relates to digital specifically. <laughs> All right. And then we might've covered this already, yeah. but in your opinion, yeah. what is the most important factor for having a successful digital marketing career? Can I give like a two prong answer? Absolutely. <laughs> First of all, I think it depends on how you define success. Um, for me, um, and I don't know that I'm there yet a hundred percent, but for me, it's really that opportunity to take a brand to the next level digitally, you know, use digitally, however, you, whether it's, you know, technology and targeting or IOT and, and trying different platforms, et cetera. So that's success to me in a lot of ways. And I think, again, with that patience and how quickly or not quickly a brand and company can move, um, that is kind of helping or not helping me achieve, you know, that level of success. Um, but I would say in digital marketing, I mean, I think it's the, the confidence in knowing your area of expertise, right? I think there's so much to learn and you guys are always talking, you know, like you're at the mercy of Google and Facebook in a lot of these cases. And I think it's like, how much can you learn and be ahead of the curve so that when you're sitting in meetings and people think they know what they're talking about, about the Facebook and the ads and the things, you're like, hold the phone, right? I mean, I, <laughs> I think it's really um, having that depth and breadth of expertise in either the specific tactics that you are a specialist in, or if it's kind of all of it and really just kind of staying ahead of, of um, as much information and industry trends as possible so that, you know, the next company doing the next cool thing will come recruit you for something awesome. I think that's success, right? That, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's your version of that's success. That's perfect. All right. So the last question, where can people find you if they just need more Alex in their life? Everywhere. Um, so I have a lot of fun on LinkedIn these days. Um, 
like I just posted um, a screenshot of an awesome Facebook Live that I did that was mortifying, but you know, <laughs> got to do new things all the time. Um, so LinkedIn, Alexandra Suazo. Um, I got back on the Twitter recently too um, because I was kind of tired of Facebook and Snapchat. Um, so I'm on the Twitter on uh, the Alex Suazo. Okay, and we'll put those links in our show notes as well. Perfect. So if you're looking at our marketing clock, you can click on through. And trust me, Twitter needs more Alex Suazo. <laughs> I know this. <laughs> I hope so. I, I, I need to be more active. I made the, I did the call recently. I'm excited about it. <laughs> All right. Well, a big thank you for coming on today's show, our marketing clock off the clock version, and for sharing that amazing journey with us all. Again, Alexandra Suazo on LinkedIn and the Alex Suazo on Twitter. So please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so that you'll stay up to date with our famous Friday news shows that keep you in the know each and every week. And we will see you here again next week.